Welcome to episode number 110 of the Marine Layer podcast. We welcome on Mariners broadcaster Aaron Goldsmith, a conversation about his hair. Yes, his hair. We had to ask about it. His broadcast prep, the Mariners offseason, and his journey to the big leagues. We also react to Ryan Stanick signing with the Mariners. Here's your reminder before we start the show. If you're listening to the podcast, make sure to download our episodes, rate and review five stars. You're doing us a huge favor. That's across all our audio platforms. And if you're watching on YouTube, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. The big subscribe button, just click it. It takes one second to do. It's free. It's easy. Check us out on social media, too. We've got a bunch of spring training stuff coming up. And you can find all of that on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, and YouTube shorts at Marine Layer Pod. Let's get it rolling. The pitch from Acevedo. And we welcome you to this episode of the Marine Layer Podcast, part of the Just Baseball Podcast Network, recording here on Monday evening, March 11th. And if you're watching on YouTube and can tell by my sunburns, we're back from spring training. Oh, I had sunburns too. They were just earlier in the week. Man, I underestimated that 70 degree sun so bad. 70 degrees isn't that hot, but that Arizona sun... It's no joke. We should know that, obviously, but somehow I underestimated it. Can I na- Can I just say I nailed the prediction on last Friday's episode? We had to record it way in advance, and it released when we were in Peoria. But man, I listened to my opening monologue on that episode. I, I crushed it. I did. I just left out the fact that I would also find a way to get sunburned right up here where I missed the sunscreen. What, what did you say on the opening line again? I said, oh, you'll be listening when you listen to us. We'll be in Peoria. Lau will probably already be sunburnt by now. He was. <sighs> Again, usually I'm so good at avoiding it. So somehow TJ just peeked right into the future because I'm a huge sunscreen wearer. But not that day, I guess. I really, really underestimated it. I and would what's, say, up, what's up with the 70 FPS and I'm still getting burnt? I know. What's that- up with that? I don't know because again that like I buy like the the high SPF sunscreen because I don't want to get sunburned but Arizona's I mean we should know that right the Arizona sun is very real but anyway I would say we are flying back here today on Monday early in the morning especially you going straight to work I'd say in the best way possible we're both exhausted from everything we've done this past week in the best way because it was a blast but I would say we're exhausted speaking of that We'll go into everything about spring training on Friday. We had a long conversation with Aaron Goldsmith today, so we want to leave enough time for that. But if you want to hear us do a full spring training recap, there's two things you can do. We're going to do a special Speak Your Mind on Friday's episode where we go into detail about everything and give you guys a real peek behind the curtain about what we were up to, what our favorite parts were. But also, there are going to be three three vlogs coming out. There's one out already by the time you're listening to this podcast. And there will be two additional ones. So we were there six days total. There will be three vlogs, each of them two days. If you want to check that out from spring training, you can do that too. So spring training, all in all, very fun. We will save all the details for later in the week. You won't save, see this in the vlog, so I'll just mention it. It's not even like kind of a brag. When Lyle mentions we're exhausted, we're recording this a little bit past 9 o'clock here on Monday evening. Our day today, Lyle, started at 2.45 in the morning. And here we are, still going strong. All I needed was a large nitro cold brew from Dutch Brothers. And I'm, I'm still going. Wow. I'm on, I should be falling asleep right now. That's wow. what I should be doing. Listen, when a Sunday night flight is like $250 more expensive than the early Monday morning flight, you say, you know what? We're going to suck it up for one day and get on the early morning flights. And that's what we did. And now we're back here recording a podcast. So in the best way possible, once again, it really never stops. Let's get to some of the news that happened while we were in Peoria on Friday. It came out right there in the morning when you and I are walking around there on the patio. The Mariners finally listen to me. They add Ryan Stanek off the free agent pile. He's going to join the Mariners bullpen after... It was announced this weekend that Jackson Coar will go on the injured list. He'll get Tommy John. He'll be out for quite a while. 
With the addition of Ryan Stanek, as I phrased before, they have a chance to unlock something here with Ryan Stanek and piece together this bullpen into into dead serious the best bullpen in baseball. There's there might not be any if ands or buts anymore. This might just straight up be the best bullpen in baseball now. Not just the best bullpen in baseball. If it all pans out with every guy, this is what we talked about in our little reactionary video, which is up on social media right after they made the signing. But there's a lot of what ifs. Matt Brash needs to get healthy. Gregory Santos needs to get healthy. The unit as a whole needs to stay on the field all year. But man, if these guys all do what they're supposed to do, you're not only talking about the best bullpen in baseball, but of all these Mariner bullpens over the last few years that have been so good, this can be the best one. Like when you talk about name brands in this bullpen, this is the most legit one. And obviously they found guys that were not highly valued by the rest of the league that they've turned into stars over the last couple of years. But when you look at the arms in this bullpen, there are six guys currently that are studs. You've got the four righties, with Munoz, Brash, Santos, and now Ryan Stanek. And you've got the two Southpaws and Gabe Spire and Taylor Saucedo, who often get forgot about in this bullpen because you think of the four righties and how high powered they are as arms with their hard fastballs and all the swing and miss stuff. Gabe Spire and Taylor Saucedo are legit stud relievers. And often they just get forgot about in this bullpen. So you're talking about six guys that are true dominant forces in this bullpen. And if it all pans out, yeah, this can be the best bullpen the Mariners have had. This might also be the best stuff bullpen in baseball, too. I mean, my God. Like, listen to who you just listen to who you just rattled off. And you and I can tell from, like, in person standing next to Gregory Santos and then standing back and watching him rip, grip, and throw a baseball. I mean, holy shit. <laughs> like, seriously. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're Ryan, talking— And Ryan Stanek is huge. Yeah. So Gregory Santos, when he threw his bullpen that we were watching, he wasn't even going full strength because it was the first true bullpen he thrown. So he was throwing, what did they say, 92, 93? But they let him rip one sinker at the very end that they said had ridiculous movement, hit 97 miles an hour. And like every pitcher was standing around and watching him throw too. Like everybody made their way over to the mound. They wanted to watch Gregory Santos throw. And you could tell guys were like, oh, yeah, like this guy, this guy's legit. So, yeah, that was pretty cool. And when you talk about the stuff, it's right in front of your eyes. Here's what Ryan Stanek brings. He came off a down year last season. He had an ERA a little bit over four. It was a disappointment from his 2022 season when the Astros won the World Series. He had an ERA of 1.15. You look at that and you say, oh, my goodness, that is amazing. Ryan Stenick certainly is not a perfect reliever. He has his flaws. He walks a lot of batters. Results-wise, compared to the rest of the league, his off-speed pitches are inconsistent. He has had one ultra-amazing season. There's a couple of outlier factors in that season. He only gave up two home runs in that season. It was by far a career low in home runs per fly ball allowed, home run to fly ball percentage, which I think is a good stat to use to track is a guy getting lucky with the amount of fly balls he's allowing, yet not allowing home runs. You allow enough fly balls, you're going to allow home runs. What's a prerogative of this Mariners bullpen? Not allowing home runs. That's why they have so many sinker ballers in this bullpen. And he also walks a lot of guys, too. The Mariners were the, had the second highest first pitch strike percentage of all time last year. Second highest ever in the history of baseball, in the pitch tracking era. The second highest. And if Ryan Stanek comes out and is walking a lot of guys, I mean, that's not really up their prerogative of dominating the zone. So it's interesting. It's an interesting fit because he's not a total Mariners mold, not initially. And he's a little bit older than the guys they will take in off the scrap heap and try and rehab and try and find something. And he's a guy who's already had a ton of big league success. He's already shown he can be a very successful big league reliever. But you got to think there's something the Mariners can find there to fine-tune Ryan Stanek in his mid-30s a little bit. And again, he's been around the block. He knows what works for him. Can the Mariners find a happy medium there? I, I think so. When you've had as much success as he's had in his career in the bullpen, you'd have to think. First off, as we know, the Mariners don't sign relievers, especially to the money they're giving Stanek, which isn't crazy, but it's not nothing. It's Four million bucks with incentives that can get up to six million. 
they're not spending that money on him if they think he's going to be off the team midseason. No, they think he can be a legit impact bullpen arm. And when you look at what he's done in his career, 2023 was his worst career season. I'm throwing out the 10 innings he threw in 2020. That doesn't count. He has been really, really good in his career. Like you look down, obviously ERA doesn't tell you everything, but the ERAs year by year up until 23 say this guy has been a dominant reliever for most of his career. So you would think the Mariners see at least that at the very least and say they know there's things to work with there, even if he walks guys at a high rate. And also when you look at his pitch by pitch results, there's, there's things there too. So When you want to talk about the actual value of each pitch compared to the rest of the league, there's one that stands out. His fastball is his best pitch. There is no question, no doubt about it. His forcing fastball is his best pitch. But when you look at something like his split finger, which he has three offerings, the split finger being one of them, the value in it of itself compared to the rest of the league can be a little bit hit or miss. But when you just talk about what opponents hit against that pitch, it makes you raise an eyebrow in a good way. Last three years, Ryan Stanek's split finger has garnered results of opponents hitting a buck 33 in 2021, 189 in 2022, 189 in 2023. That's pretty good. And that's not his primary pitch either. So I would guess that's another area where the Mariners say, oh, well, he gets some results with that pitch. There's something to work with there. Again, it's going to be about throwing strikes all in all, but he's got the stuff. Certainly has the stuff. And speak of stuff. I was curious to the stuff plus it's like, so how does it play? Duh. Is there something to work with there? Or was he, did he have a season of like outlier good location? Uh, His stuff plus overall last year in the Astros bullpen, despite the mediocre, you know, run the ERA, the run prevention, 131 overall, like 31% better than league average, pure stuff coming out of his right hand, 131. That's pretty good. Now, the Astros had a pretty good bullpen last year, so he was only third behind Ryan Presley and Brian Abreu. But if you're going to be behind two relievers on your own team, those are two pretty good options. Those are two of the best relievers in baseball. So there's no shame there. And if you look at the breakdown of all three of his pitches, I mean, all three of his pitches, you can make the argument the stuff on it is good enough for those pitches to be either good or elite. His split finger, 117 stuff plus. His fastball, 128. Fastballs, by the way, uh, there are not many 128 stuff plus fastballs. There's, you know, it. fastballs are a little a little closer to the median or the, the, the 100, the league average, more often than not. This is 128, his fastball. That can go well over 100 miles an hour. And then here's the most interesting one, because this seems like at least percentage used throughout his career. He's primarily known for his fastball and his splitter his slider has the best stuff plus by far 153 and he only throws it the third most of all of his pitches it's about 18 percent for the last three years combined dude 153 so 53 percent above league average in terms of pure stuff on what has results-wise been his first pitch. You know everything we've heard from these bullpen guys this winter, from talking to Topa, from talking to Sauce, talking to Spire. We heard the story about Trent Thornton, too, saying when these guys walked out of these pitcher meetings with the Mariners group, and they'd be like, wow, I haven't had conversations like that before. My eyes have been so open. I'll bet you that slider is something they're looking at with Ryan Stanek. They say the stuff on it is that good, but it's not quite getting the results it should. That says maybe he's putting it in the wrong spots, but I'll bet you, like at least for now, he's been putting it in the wrong spots, at least in some of his down years, which is why maybe it hasn't quite gotten the results. I'll bet you we're going to see more Ryan Stanek sliders this year. You can take that to the bank, and the Mariners are going to say, when you throw this pitch and put it in the right location, this can be a weapon. What What do the Mariners love with their relievers? They love fastballs and sliders. Stanek has that. And I will bet you, you're going to see him throw some sliders this year. And I would not be shocked in the slightest if his slider results jump way up in 2024. It's, I think, all going to depend on how many strikes he throws. Mm -hmm. He can't walk more than 10% of the guys like he's done in his career. Mm -hmm. Like that, his, you know, average per nine innings for his career is about four to five. Like that's way too many. 
mm-hmm. way too many for what the Mariners like. So that's a lot of what it's going to come down to, throwing strikes, because the stuff plays. But if Stanek's dancing around the strike zone instead of throwing in it, that might be an issue. And it would be harder for Scott Service and Jerry Depoto to trust him later in games if he keeps walking guys and letting guys on base, because they know guys like Matt Brash, like Andres Munoz, like Gabe Spire, like Taylor Saucedo won't do that. And they And Scott trusts those guys a lot. I'm curious to see how long it will take them to trust Danik. He's a vet, but he's a first year M. So how's that going to play out? I'll tell you what. Like, seriously, this is like truly unique for Mm -hmm. this regime and what they're doing with relievers. They have, they have taken relievers like off the scrap heap and put them in and had them earn their trust. This is a proven guy. Mm -hmm. Proven like a truly unique circumstance, which is why it, it, it is a little difficult for your, you and I to predict how he gets used this year. Does he instantly earn that trust or not? Right. I don't know. And it's not just a proven arm. It's been a proven star bullpen arm in the past. Like mm-hmm. star bullpen piece of many very good teams. So you're right. There's a lot of places Ryan Stanek could probably sign where he'd be the guy. He'd be maybe the second guy in the bullpen behind a closer. But you're right. In this bullpen there will be some trust to be earned because there's guys in this bullpen that are proven. Like you said, that being said, one way or another, however it's going to play out, I'm excited to see it. You were banging the drum on this for weeks. I was on board with you. We know what Stanek can do. We didn't think he was going to cost that much. He didn't. And this bullpen group, man, they are locked and loaded. We said that about Gregory Santos. And if Ryan Stanek does what he can do, oh, it just got a step better. I cannot wait to watch this bullpen group. I really can't. Two weeks until opening day, little over two weeks, two and a half. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Even if we're not getting all of them on opening day, we're probably we're getting Stanek on opening day. It seems like that. So, mm-hmm. buckle up. I agree, and that'll be his chance to prove it too. If if Brash and Santos are gonna miss a couple weeks, they're gonna put Stanek in some leverage situations. And if he pitches well in those situations, he's gonna pitch and leverage a lot of the year. So yeah, it'll all be fascinating to see how it all plays out. All right. We had an awesome conversation with Goldie. Before that, let's talk to you guys about our great friends over at Pagacha's Pub 85. That's over in Kirkland, Pagacha's Pub 85. We love to hang out there. There's spring training games still going on. And better yet, opening day, like TJ just mentioned, is so close. It's just a couple weeks away. So if you want a place to go hang out with your friends and watch the Mariners game, go there. Head over to Pagacha's Pub 85. There's 22 TVs in that place. And you can get great food. Some great drink specials. You can go play a game of pool and watch the game at the same time. If you go during happy hour too, you want to show up with some friends before a seven o'clock game and get started a little bit early and get some great happy hour specials. Those are on Monday through Friday from two to 6 p.m. It features $3 domestic beers, $4 Manny's Blue Moons, $4 Mac and Jacks, $4 Wells, and $4 house wines. All of that is over at Pagacha's Pub 85 in Kirkland. I am thrilled that we got to talk to Aaron Goldsmith. Obviously, he is somebody that I think is a like-minded thinker to the two of us in terms of how he watches baseball. He has a fantastic conversation, and he is filled with stories. My biggest thing taking away from this conversation with Goldie, like pay attention to how he prepares. Major League Baseball players prepare like professional athletes. Aaron Goldsmith prepares like a major league baseball broadcaster. It is incredible. The amount of detail he will explain of how he prepares for a baseball game. All the stuff you never hear about on route, never hear about on the radio that goes in to his mind when he's studying these guys to get ready for a baseball game is fascinating. It is a baseball nerd's dream to listen to what Aaron Goldsmith has to say about just getting ready for any normal Tuesday night baseball game. Awesome. Goldie is the man. He is the man. I, I loved this. This was an, he's, he's, he's just awesome. Yeah. For every sense of the word from talking about his perfect hair to his journey as a broadcaster, which I thought was really interesting. Like if you want to hear what it's, if you want to hear what it's like to go through an interview as a big league broadcaster, Listen to this conversation with Goldie. We talk about it, and he gives a full breakdown of what it looked like when he was going through the interview process. It's so interesting, and I think you guys 
for everything we talked about in this conversation between those two things, between baseball, the Mariners off season, Saber metrics, you're going to love this conversation. All right, let's get to our conversation with Aaron Goldsmith. All right, we have Mariners broadcaster Aaron Goldsmith on with us. Aaron, appreciate you taking some time to join us. So just to start off, a lot of people recognize your voice. They love your voice. They covet your voice. They really want your voice. They want to find a way to replicate it. But I have something even deeper as it relates to myself. How can I replicate your hair? How is it possible? (laughs) How, How is it possible to replicate that hair? Like, I need to know the secret. Well, TJ Lyle, it's great to be with you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's like like having a, a good voice and having a good head of hair is like being tall. Like I did nothing to earn either thing. And I'm just trying to maximize both to my greatest abilities. So and, I'm glad that this is on camera, right? So I can... Right, right. Go I check out the it. YouTube page just to see. I mean, even here we are. It's a Monday night at 7 o'clock. And Goldie looks like he's ready to get on television. Like it's like it's April on Root Sports. He's ready to go. Well, I, I am. I I do wear a good amount of hats in the off season. Uh, so you I you did catch me on a good day. I was prepared. I assumed there was going to be a video component here. So couldn't be all bed heady for you guys. I mean, come on. But there's no. Uh, I I see no after effects of the hat. I put a hat on, and it looks like <laughs> someone just sat on my head for a week. And oh, if, I, if I had a hat on earlier today, it would look like I had a hat on. Like, it's like, once you put the hat on, it's game over. Like, the bomb has exploded. There are no survivors. It's, there's nothing that can be salvaged. You just got to start over again. I'm convinced you can just shake your head like this, and it just snaps into place. I wish, man. Like, I will say, uh, not to dwell on this, because I know that people don't really care, uh, but it it is a pretty well-trained beast at this point, you know? Like, it doesn't take, like, Divish... This will surprise you that Divish and I kind of go at it every once in a while uh, outside the manager's office. But Divish always gives me a hard time about my hair, which I fully enjoy. And it's like, it doesn't take very much. It, I've been doing this for a while now. So like the hair, it knows where it should go, you know, That's a, which is good. That's a good thing. I'm glad you brought up Divish because he said to us this past week, yeah, it's fake. So I was going to give you a chance to respond <laughs> to that. Yeah, I think he's called it the hair helmet before. <laughs> Um, which like then I'll take a pot shot at his hair and then like there's nobody who will make fun of their own hair more than Divish will so (laughs) and like the amount of money that he spends on his haircuts might rival mine simply out of volume he gets his hair cut like every four days practically (laughs) so how do you keep it so perfect when you go down to the heat in Arizona like you're heading down this week no problem whatsoever I get a cut right before I go I get a cut right before I come back and nobody ever notices anything, you know? And we've, we've been doing this for a while, guys. We've got a system down, okay? I've had haircuts in Arizona before. They've never gone well. So I do everything I can to avoid that, take care of business on the homeland, and it's uh, turned out okay. Speaking of the homeland, Goldie, I, I would imagine this has been a one-of-a-kind offseason for you since you've been with the Mariners, just after everything that happened last off season for you and you really sort of starting to dial back on the national stuff and, and calling college basketball and such in the off season. Has it felt a little different this off season for you? Yeah, it's felt like a one of a kind off season to date. Um, and it will be my new normal going forward, but you're right. Like I've done, I did no football again this year. My second year, not doing football. My basketball has been cut like more than half. I normally did about 20 some games, low 20s. And this year, I, I don't think I hit 10. I think I did about eight. Um, and I'll tell you what, man, like I'm exhausted. Like being Mr. Mom with three kids and a wife, like it is so much work. It's like so much more work than the baseball season. So I'm ready for a little change of pace. It's been awesome being home so much. It's exactly what I wanted. Um, but it's a lot of dishes. A lot of bedtime stories, uh, a lot of picking up, right? Like all the things, like all the things that any parent is listening to right now can relate to. Um, I coached my boys' basketball teams this winter, which was a ton of fun. So it was everything that I dreamt, and I'm exhausted. <laughs> so I'm ready for some baseball. Did you get teed up? I, you know, I never got teed up at our last game. 
one of the officials did bark over at our bench and told us that only one coach can stand at a time, which I don't think was actually in the rule book, but <laughs> it was in that guy's rule book. So we, we obliged. Did you guys, what was your guys' record or did they, do they, are they even at the age where they keep a record? So my two boys are very, are fairly different ages. My youngest is four. So no record there. It's just pandemonium, right? Like nobody dribbles, nobody passes. There's really nothing that resembles basketball. And then my oldest is nine. He's in third grade. And they did keep record. We we were nine and one. We came in second place. It was a really fun season. Uh, we had like an offensive set. We had an inbounds play. Uh, so like we did some things. We did some things. You know, all my years in the on the college basketball circuit helped after watching all those shoot arounds over the years. So it was fun. Which coach do you model your game after? Your yeah, coaching I'm a style. big Dana Altman guy. Big Dana Altman mm-hmm. guy. Good choice. Get in the honey hole. Get in the honey hole. You know, um, Dana's got all the. Nebraska sayings that I try to duplicate as a fellow Midwesterner. So Dana, like, um, I try to wear like the dad Nike shoes like Dana wears. Um, so that's, that's my role model. I would say another part of your off season, it seems outside of, like you said, the whole stay at home dad aspect you've been, I mean, you've been doing some content here in spring training. We, we're trying to be the content people here, Goldie, but then your face keeps showing up on, mm-hmm on TikTok and on Instagram and on the Mariners social media pages and almost blowing us out of the water. Where's that creativity come from? You know, they have a conference room at T-Mobile Park called the the Griffey Room, and it's got Junior all over the walls and autographed memorabilia. It's where the highest level meetings with the Mariners take place. And all the heads of state gathered together, and they said, we got to go after those marine layer guys. <laughs> we got to take them down. They're taking too much of our content. Um Oh, by the way, time out. My wife saw this on our family calendar, Marine Layer Podcast, and she, for like one second, was super pumped that I was going on a podcast with the clothing line Marine Layer, uh, which, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> <You've gotten that. laughs> uh, would have been great, uh, but even better. Um, so I really enjoyed it early on. You know, we've only done a handful of videos at the time we're recording this. They're all like a minute. Uh, I think the idea is try to find another platform, another another creative outlet to just tell the Mariner story, right? Whatever it might be. Um, I think it's a little more difficult right now. Uh, right, I'm not yet in Arizona, so I don't have access to the players. A, a number of them I did talk to on the Hot Stove Show which I've been able to use some of that sound in at least one of those uh, videos, which has been great. Uh, But I can't just like walk up to Mitch Hanniger and talk to him and then go make something based on that. But that'll change once I get down there. And of course, once the season starts, but I think the hope is to continue to do this with some frequency, a couple times a week, once the season begins. And hopefully if I find something that I think is interesting, other people will find it interesting as well. That's kind of how I base almost anything I say on the air. Like if I trust myself, if I think it's interesting, then I think there's a good chance you guys will find it interesting. So I kind of take that curiosity and that mindset into these. I've only done a couple of them really in the grand scheme of things. Um, Hopefully there's a lot more to come, but they'll evolve. I'm sure they'll change. They'll get better. But uh, overall, I think it's been a pretty smooth takeoff and hopefully people have enjoyed them. My hope is, I'm sure very similar to what you guys do, is I hope that in 60 seconds, when somebody watches one of these, that they just find like some red meat that they can sink their teeth into, right? Something that they can walk away with, or when they go grab a bite with their buddy later that evening, they can say, hey, I just found out this cool thing about this Mariner, right? Or about the team or whatever. And it's just something they can hold on to. And they feel like they're smarter or entertained, or more informed, or a combination of all those things. So we'll see where it goes, but so far it's been pretty fun. How much would it warm your heart if after somebody took away from watching your video, like you said, they go and have lunch with a friend, and instead of sitting down and talking about a player's RBI total, they're talking about Mitch Garver's pull side loft? Yeah, well, first of all, I would never talk about RBIs. Let's get that out there right now. There you so, go. Um, uh, no, I'm kidding, uh, but I'm not, but I'm kidding. <clears throat> yeah, I like. <laughs> I think hopefully... I guess I think I kind of have maybe to some people like a quirky baseball way of 
talking or thinking. Um, and I bring that on the broadcast here and there and when I think it might be appropriate or might be fun. But obviously, this is an avenue where I can do more of that. And uh, yeah, I've worked quality airborne contact into two of them so far. So one of my uh, personal favorite baseballisms, like that should be a t-shirt, quality airborne contact. Uh, so we'll see. We'll see on the bingo card how many of those I get worked in over the course of the full season. Do you think you, is that more of a of a radio terminology? Or are you going to have to to wait until you're on route to do that? I mean, I I personally feel like that's more of a route thing. Hey, look, look, Mike, Mike Flowers, quality airborne contact here. Look at that. Yeah, I think Mike would say, "Is that right?" <laughs> <laughs> it might be Mike's response to it. Um, well, the visual would help, right? Like to be able to see yeah. what uh, Q. What was that? Quality airborne QAC. Okay. What QAC like looked like. Um, yeah. So I I think I've worked it in once or twice before, uh, but maybe it'll be a more regular thing now. That's a good segue because you're somebody that, like you just mentioned, you're very, very tuned in on analytics, as are we. Like, we don't really talk about RBIs or batting average either for whatever it's worth. But I'm always curious how people a little bit older than us and their baseball fandom have kind of accepted analytics and kind of like at what moment they kind of sat and said to themselves oh this is really unique fans should understand this baseball Mm -hmm. people should understand this so like in your time as a broadcaster even just as a baseball fan what was your moment where you said oh i really like the sabermetric stuff yeah it's funny years ago i remember i when wrc plus started coming out i remember barking at the wind and being like what what is this like this looks dumb it sounds dumb it's got to be dumb and for i don't know like maybe a year a whole season i just kind of brushed it under the rug and dismissed it and then finally during the off season i remember thinking like this thing keeps coming up like i keep reading people that i really respect and who I think are very smart baseball people writing using WRC plus. Hey, here's an idea. Maybe I should learn what it is. And my biggest takeaway from that, that I would share with everyone. And probably most people listening to this are like on that path and probably maybe already know what that is, but I think it holds true for anything, right? Any, any stat that we're talking about or measurement like almost all these things are really simple to understand. They're really not complicated. I'm sure you guys will vouch for that as well. They just look different because we're used to all the other things and like RBIs and home runs and stolen bases and batting average. I've been used to that for a hundred years. And this stuff looks like it landed from some other planet and it's wonky and it's got uppercase and lowercase numbers and there's a plus sign or a minus sign sometimes. But like, it's been five minutes. Like, Google it. It's been five minutes, and you'll be like, oh, no, that makes a lot of sense. And if I were a player, I would want to be measured on that. I mean, that's one way I think about it a lot. Like, if you were a player, okay, Mr. Joe Mariner fan, like, wouldn't you want to be rewarded for hitting a double versus a single? Wouldn't that be worth, wouldn't you feel better? when you stood up at second base and when you stood up at first base? And wouldn't you want to be rewarded for drawing a walk? Because you won't be in batting average. So uh, I think the constant challenge for all broadcasters is how to incorporate it, how to educate without patronizing or making a broadcast feel like a lecture or a classroom. I always keep in mind the person who just worked a full nine to five at a job that they can't stand. They curse their boss in the car car ride home. They get home to their family and children. They got to cook dinner. They're trying to put food on the table. Kids are screaming and their outlet is just to flip on the M's game. Like they just want to hear the crack of the bat. They want to hear the crowd. They want to see the uniforms. And there are some times where the last thing you want to hear is me going, well, 100 is league average in WRC plus, <laughs> right? And so like, like that's a, if you did like a pie chart of our fans, like that's a percentage of them, right? 
<laughs> so I want to be sensitive to that, but I also can't ignore it. So it's just constantly trying to find the balance, choosing the right time, trying to keep a mental inventory of how many times you've gone over this. When was the last time you talked about it? Um, I think we've been pretty progressive in the broadcast and I give our, our producer Curtis Wilson a lot of credit because if your producer is not willing to get into the analytics, that's not going to happen. Like everybody's got to be on board with this to get it on the show. It's not like a radio broadcast where if the three of us do a radio broadcast, like when TJ calls any in his innings, he can just talk about RBIs and batting average. And when Lyle does his innings, he can just talk about Wova. When I do mine, I'm talking ex Wova, right? Like we can all do our thing on TV. Like we're, we all have to hold hands. We have to. And if we don't, we all look foolish. So it really starts with the producer. If he's not on board with it, it's like the graphics won't be made. And if the graphics aren't made, then it's just me windbagging about it with no other support. So really around the 2020 season, Curtis came to me and said, hey, I really want to get into this more. What do you think we should do? Should it be WRC plus? Should it be OPS plus? Should we do WOBA? So we had a lot of conversations. We talked to a number of people internally with the analytics department with the Mariners. And we just kind of went with WRC plus as our kind of go-to while still incorporating weighted on base average uh, when appropriate. Scott uses weighted on base in game on his cards. Like if you guys see him in the dugout holding the cards, all of his matchup numbers are all WOBA. Um, I think WRC plus once you get past the name and the look of it is like the easiest thing to understand, right? That everyone can relate to instantly. Um, so I give Curtis a ton of credit and I'm just really grateful that we have the, the structure in place where like him bringing that up was accepted. Me jumping on board with it was double accepted. And then it was just like, we're off. And I don't know how many other broadcasts use it. Not many that I've seen. Uh, but hopefully more and more start to incorporate it where they think is appropriate. The root setup is is pretty sick. I mean, you guys are really, as you said, all on board with putting it on there. I mean, I really don't think batting average doesn't even come up on the root graphics anymore. I don't think so. Like it more more often than not, it is WRC plus on there. So it's a little bit easier for you to mention it, bring it up and constantly talk about it. How do you approach on the radio bringing it up? You guys have such a diverse set of people in that radio booth rotating throughout the year, and not everyone uses it. So how do you make your decision on where you'll insert that in, in something where you need to be keeping track of everything at once? That's a really good question. Um, What I have learned the hard way, like, I don't, I don't know if there's a way to learn in broadcasting without just falling on your face. Like that's, that's just how you do it, (laughs) unfortunately. And hopefully the longer you do this, the more the falling on your face is in the rearview mirror and not looking through the windshield. I have really dialed back how many numbers I give on the air. Now, if we're en route and there's a graphic, that's different. I like, I I'm probably perceived like if you did a, like uh, if you put like all of our headshots up to Mariner fans of all the broadcasters and you were like, which one's the numbers guy? Like, probably everyone would point to me or Gary, right? Or both of us. Um, And, like, that's fair. I do love the numbers, and I'm not put off by that at all. I'm, that's great. I'm almost flattered by it. But I have found, again, the hard way, that just saying numbers, whether it's WRC Plus or home runs or ribbies or whatever, man, it just really gets lost in the traffic of a broadcast so easily. People tune out. When I listen, If I hear too many numbers like consecutively and I do this for a living, I kind of start to be like, well, well, hold on. Wait, what was that? What was the second number again? And so when I prep, I will write a lot of numbers in my book. But instead of saying them on the air, I'll just say Jorge Polanco has hit for much better power left handed than right handed. Like, I could say to you, he's slugging this versus righties, this versus lefties. But let's face it, for like 98% of the audience, they don't know what a good slugging percentage is, right? So what I figured out is simply by 
talking into a microphone, I have authority. Like Dave has authority. Rick has authority. Gary has authority. Now, it, don't get me wrong. Like it comes, part of that authority comes with being someplace for a duration of time. Like in Rick's case, forever, right? Like he is the greatest authority because of that. But because you are a known broadcaster and people trust you and believe you. And as long as you don't break that trust, if you just say they've had a really hard time hitting his fastball, but his breaking ball has been susceptible to being put in play. Like done, done, right? Done. The, the really nerdy numbers that I love to just like dig into and analyze and break down. I email those, (coughs) pardon me. I email those to our graphic guys. That's what we build graphics on because you can put it on the screen and people have time to look at it and they hear me saying it. And those two things at once overlapping help you consume it and digest it. Um, don't get me wrong. I do say numbers, but I just find ways to avoid them. Or when I say them, say them in like great generalities, like TJ is hitting a hundred points higher off of lefties than righties. Now, he might be hitting 97 points higher, right? But just like, just say 100. Just say nearly 100 points better off of lefties than righties. It just washes over your ears better, you know? So like, I think the whole numbers thing on a broadcast is you, you could talk to 10 people and you get 10 different answers to what people want. There's power in the numbers. There's education in the numbers. It explains why managers are making decisions, Right. Like that's why this is why Mike Ford is batting right now, going back to last year. Right. This is why Gabe Spire is pitching right now. Okay. Um, so I like to use them to support decisions that are made, um, or to try to predict some type of outcome. But that doesn't mean I have to specifically say those numbers. Um, hold me to that. Hopefully I'll continue that this year. I will say I echo everything you said a couple minutes ago about this stuff not being that hard to understand. And the elevator pitch I always use to people that don't want to learn it is I say to them, well, is a single as valuable as a home run? And they'll be like, well, no. And I'm like, but batting average tells you it is. Like there's other things that can assess the stuff a little bit better if you ask me. You know what's funny? I agree with all that, obviously. Um, So last year I was coaching third base at my son's Little League game. And there was a kid who put a ball in play and he smoked it, like smoked it. And out loud, I go, wow, hit that hard. And it's like, yeah, even in Little League, the guys who hit the ball hard stand out. And like you want, yeah, you want them to hit the ball hard, right? But like there are people who will say, oh, hard hit rate. I don't care. Just put it in play. That doesn't mean anything. No. Hey, go grab a glove, stand on the left side of the infield when a right-handed batter is hitting, and we'll get a guy who hits the ball hard and a guy who doesn't hit the ball hard. And you tell me which one you think's got a better chance of being a hit when you put the glove on and stand by the bat, right? Like, I don't care if it's Little League or the show, hitting the ball hard is a skill set and has value. That doesn't mean that it's the most important thing. Like, I always think of it as like two elevators passing each other. And where is the meeting point of, consistent contact or as consistent as kind of feasible for that player while also being able to hit the ball hard, right? Like obviously Joey Gallo hits the ball harder than almost anyone makes no contact at all. He is such an extreme in the elevators being like ones in the penthouse and ones in the parking garage. It does almost no good, right? It's like, where is the equilibrium of those two things? And the numbers are nuanced in that regard. And I love that. Like, I love that conversation. Do I think batting average is the end all be all? No. Do I think it has value? Yeah, it has value. Like almost everything has some value. Like I would choose a different stat as my, I can only choose one stat. It's for me, it would be WRC plus. Um, But that doesn't mean that this whole thing isn't a tapestry, right? Like different guys have different skill sets. I don't want a lineup of, all Stephen Kwans, right? But I also don't want a lineup of all Edwin Encarnacion's, right? Like I want to, I want to 
mosaic of all of them. That's that's how a good lineup is made up. And we have different numbers to be able to recognize the gifts, the qualities, the skill sets that make players valuable. And I love that we have all these measurements to celebrate that. Like I love when we play the Guardians and I can talk about Stephen Kwan's contact rate. Like it's incredible, right? It's unbelievable how well he, or, or arise. Like it's otherworldly. When we played the Marlins last year, when the Mariners played the Marlins, I was so fascinated by how they were going to pitch a rise every at bat. Like, are they just going to throw right down the chute? Like, just get it over with? He's going to put the ball in play. What are they going to do? And so, being able to talk about contact ability, right? How much in the zone contact he makes. Like, there are all these avenues. I was a kid in a candy shop, being able to research this, put into graphics, and then watch it play out in front of us. It's all so much fun. I can't imagine calling baseball 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Like, it would not, for me and what I am curious about, it would not be nearly as gratifying. Um, I love that every night I can, as the game's playing out, I can look something up on Savant, Fangraphs, Reference, whatever it might be, and, and like validate how special something is, right? Like, show a fan how unique a player is. That stuff to me is so much fun, and it's really so accessible. Fans have never been smarter, even if they want to just bark at the wind at some of this stuff. Uh, it's never been easier to be an informed fan than it is right now. And what I look at during a game and to prep is what anybody in the world can look at, right? Like, there's nothing proprietary about it. So if you're into this stuff, teach yourself. That's what I did. That's what you guys did. And it's to me, it's, it's one of the great joys of the game right now. We've talked a lot of hitting. Is there a pitching stat you like? So, <clears throat> yes. And there's a uh, there's a lot of like rate stats that I enjoy for pitching. <clears throat> um, so for a starting pitcher on my prep, I always write out their repertoire, and then I'm always curious for each pitch, um, what the ground ball rate is. Like, is this a is this a ground ball pitch? Because it's funny. Like I used to think. <clears throat> Oh, this guy's a ground ball pitcher. So, like, anything he throws, he's a ground ball, right? Well, like, that's just not true. And it's also not true that it's a ground ball as frequently to a lefty as it is to a righty. Like, my eyes have really been opened up in recent years about just platoon splits and how the, how different the ball can change based on, is it a lefty or a righty, right? And the same is true for strikeouts. Like, if Munoz is... You'd have to look this up to confirm it. <laughs> but if Munoz's slider is his best swing and miss pitch, like I'm sure it's better to righties than it is to lefties. So, like, is that a better strikeout pitch to righties than it is to lefties? Like, to me, that's intriguing. If the game's on the line on the ninth inning and he's facing a righty versus facing a lefty. So I look at ground balls. I look at um, strikeout rate on the platoon side of things. Um and then I do, I'll kind of like just click around and I kind of just go fishing is what I call it. Just see what I can find, especially on pitch types individually. Um, like, is there one that's getting hit especially hard, right? Um, I like to see changes in usage from year to year, if that stands out. Um, those are some of the ones off the top of my head. Like, I think I don't really get into spin rate too much. I think we lose a lot of people on it. And I haven't found, <coughs> pardon me, I haven't found enough um, data that shows that like, oh, if you if your spin rate is this, you're a better pitcher. Like, uh, maybe, but maybe not. Like, that might not be the case. Um, so, and I think there are certain like, I think buzzwords that I think you just lose fans on. Um, like launch angle is one of them. I think people just like, change like mute the tv immediately um <laughs> i think is another one that they'll just mute it um and then they'll like go on twitter and tag me and tell me how terrible i am <laughs> so i i try not to use those and and i don't look at them either so it, it's not like i'm restraining myself but those are a few of my do's and don'ts i'd say on the pitching side off the top of my head you're talking about prep and how you prepare for games how many screens are you up to in the booth now <clears throat> yeah it's it's um i've I have three screens. One of them is my scorebook. I keep scoring on an iPad. I've done that for a long time now. Um, seven years, maybe eight years. 
So like, I guess that is the screen. Um, and then I have uh, my laptop. And then I keep a small iPad up there. Uh, on, in Fangraphs, you can create customized leaderboards where it's really cool. Like I haven't looked at a stat pack in like five years once I discovered this. <clears throat> so with the customized leaderboards and fan graphs, you can just choose the stats that you like and put them in any order that you want. So I have like four tabs open that I can navigate and toggle between. So it'll be the Mariners individual batters, the opposing individual batters, the Mariners bullpen, and then the opposing bullpen. And so a lot of the batter stuff I use before the game that I'll, I'll write in my book. Like I'll write down average on base, WRC plus, home runs, stolen bases, caught stealings. Is that a word, caught stealings? Um, and then strikeout rate and walk rate. So that's what I write. I physically write that down for hitters. And then for the relievers, I really like it because if you name some random other team reliever comes in during the commercial break, I can toggle over to the Angels bullpen, look at his name, and I can see, like, I put a leverage index in there so I can see, does this guy pitch when it really counts or is this a mop-up guy? Which is great because it's like, oh, man, he's a mop-up guy, but he's actually pitching with the tie and run on deck. They're, oh, that's because the Angels are short tonight, right? Um, it will also tell me, I also have down uh, ground ball rate. I have some more like, so I have like FIP and XFIP. I never use it on the air. Like that, it would be an instant mute. Like, I, we don't talk about that enough for me to use it on the air enough. But what it does tell me is, is his ERA legit or not, right? And I then I can kind of like, if it if there's a big discrepancy one way or the other, now I can start to quickly research and dig into why that might be. I look at his hard hit rate. I look at his ground ball rate. I look at his repertoire, which I'll either get on fan graphs or I'll do more digging uh, on Savant, especially when it comes to the lefty righty splits. Um, and then like, I like to know how many, what's his walk rate and how many bombs has he given up? Like to me for a reliever, if you can limit dingers, and limit free passes, you're probably going to be a pretty okay reliever, right? And just have like a league average strikeout rate. And you're going to be like probably really pretty good. So that's kind of my, like my quick, I've got 60 seconds. So how do I summarize this guy without giving a bunch of numbers? Like that's a great example. You know, here's, here's Lyle out of the Astros bullpen. Sorry, you're an Astro. <clears throat> out of the Astros bullpen, you know, hey, this year, he doesn't throw hard. Sorry, Lyle. You know, he's, He's barely breaking glass. He's throwing 89 miles an hour on average. But I'll tell you what, he's got the highest ground ball rate um, of any Astros reliever this year. And because of that, he's given up the fewest home runs. And he barely ever walks anybody. He's had a really good year. Done. Like, done. Like, I've just given you the cliff notes on Lyle, the Astros reliever, in like 15 seconds. And then, it's great. Like, what if Julio takes him deep? Right? Or, conversely, what if Julio rolls over one to Bregman? You're like, well, yeah, okay. There it is. This is what Aaron just said. So, like, you can't, for me, like, I can't lose either way. Because either it plays into what he does, or it's like, wow, Mike, look at that. That's only the third home run he's given up this year. So, like, I like being able to look at those quickly, try to summarize it, paint a picture, and then see how it plays out. So looking at the numbers is super cool, but finally this week you're going to head down to spring training. When this comes out, I believe you'll be down there the day after this episode drops. What's mm -hmm. the first thing you're looking at? Who's the first person you're talk you're going to talk to when you get down there? Well, you know, it's funny. My my first broadcast will be um, the telecast of the breakout game, which I'm really looking forward to. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, for those who aren't aware, it's a new thing. Major League Baseball is doing this year. Mariners have two of them. We're televising the first one. It's going to be like a vast majority of the Mariners' top prospects versus the Padres' top prospects. So I've really been doing a ton of homework 
in the weeks leading up to it. So I'm really excited to like, I haven't seen Cole Young in person. Um, like I haven't seen uh, Johnny Formello in person, you know, you name it, any of these guys. Um, so that's, I'm really pumped for that. Like I'm excited that there will be something unique and different about a spring training game. In terms of a guy, um, I'm really excited to talk to Mitch Haniger again. Like, I love that guy. He's taught me so much. I've loved talking with him over the years. <coughs> so Mitch will be very high on my list. Cal Raleigh is just like one of my favorite dudes on the team. So I'm eager to, to talk to Cal again. Um, those are probably two off the top. And then like all the new guys. I'm, I found, again, by learning the hard way, that it's so important to establish some type of just baseline working relationship with a guy in spring training before camp breaks. Like just have a conversation, introduce yourself, maybe have a follow-up conversation a couple of days later to kind of cement it. Trying to do that once the bell rings is hard. Guys, their whole mindset shifts compared to in spring training. So uh, I've talked to some of those guys over the phone for the hot stove show, like uh, Garver and Rayleigh. Both I just could not have enjoyed more as interviews. Um, but I'm excited to meet those guys, Polanco and others in person. What have you, how, how have you evaluated what the Mariners have done this off season? Speaking of the new guys that you want to get to talk to and once you get down to Arizona, get to know a little bit. I mean, it's obviously been a very interesting off season, but I think all said and done, I think Jerry and Justin both deserve a ton of credit for the guys they've been able to bring in and get this roster for what looks to be marginally better than where I think it was a year ago. But from your perspective and how you've watched it play out, like how would you evaluate how the off season's gone? You know, it's funny. I was just, I was just randomly thinking the other day, man, who saw Hanniger for Robbie Ray coming, right? <laughs> like <clears throat> that's a curveball, big time. It's if there's one thing that this front office is especially elite at, it is, just coming up with ideas, man. Like they've got a lot of creative people. A lot of those people have been working together for a long enough time to have some real synergy. I think that's something that can't be lost in kind of the Mariners story over the years is just from Jerry to Justin to our analysts. Um, and really down to a lot of the on-field coaching staff, obviously, obviously Scott, <clears throat> but even um, guys like Trent Blank on the pitching side and Pete Woodworth, I mean, all these people have been together long enough that like the systems and the processes, not only have they found footing, like they've really taken roots and they've, they've really found what works in terms of communication. And so because of that, I think ideas flow, right? Like there's comfort, there's trust, there's belief with your circle of people that you work with that you are all relying on and for them to come up with the ideas that they did to get done and then to actually pull them off. Right. That's the biggest, the hardest part has been incredible. It's been incredible. Uh, I, I can't realistically think of a better off season given what they had to work with than what they did. And there was a point and you guys know it as well as I do. There was a point, whatever it was, three months ago, maybe right now, where you're like, what in the world is going on? And what's this team going to look like? It felt like jumping out of an airplane, like just holding the parachute back and just hoping that you could put it on and pull the cord. I was like, that's kind of what it felt like. Um, but they had a plan. They always have a plan. Like whether... Whether you're yelling at your TV because of the bullpen move that Scott's making in the seventh inning, or you're yelling at the at your buddy over the phone about who they just traded, like there's always a plan with these guys, and it's not cooked up by one guy. Like Scott's bullpen move in the seventh isn't just him working in isolation. Now he's the one who makes the decision. He's the manager, but you can be guaranteed that there was somewhere around 10 people on a video conference call that day 
at one o'clock, spending 45 minutes going over what are we going to do in the seventh inning when Kirby needs to get pulled and Alvarez comes up. There was massive synergy and roundtable conversation about that. And it's ultimately Scott's call, right? Well, the same is true with any of these trades, any of these free agent acquisitions. It is one of the things that really blows me away about the Mariners. And I'm sure there are other organizations that are structured this way now. <clears throat> it is such a collaborative effort. And I mean, there was, you remember the, the uh, Denard Span trade with the Rays eons mm-hmm. and eons and eons ago? Like that idea was cooked up by two interns. Huh. Uh, one of so, which, I think, at least one of which is now and has been a, a full time Mariners analyst for uh, like a while. Um, so they're open to ideas. Like if you are on the payroll and you are in those conversations, like you will be heard. You will be listened to. Um, uh, it's Jerry's call eventually, it's Justin's call eventually, or Scott's call eventually. But they're taking in ideas and they clearly took in a lot of ideas uh this winter and it paid off. Do they let the broadcasters have any input? I let me tell you. I've given my input, okay? <laughs> uh via text message, via in-person conversation. Uh, Scott Hunter, who's uh, in charge of the drafts for the Mariners, I've given him plenty of, of scouting tips. Um, and you know what, guys? I think they take them really seriously. Mm. <laughs> you know what's great? I was going to say, Aaron, do you, know, you know what's great? Like, we're down there last week, walking around amongst the players, you know, watching them play. Look, I mean, just looking at the lineup up there on the board in the Mariners facility outside the clubhouse and sitting there and looking <laughs> and – seeing the mood of all these guys, you couldn't tell like December ever happened. Like you couldn't, you, you would have no idea that was ever, that was ever a thing walking around, looking at that lineup, looking how these guys interact, looking how they work and looking just like at sort of the workman like slash happy attitude. Everyone has. It's amazing. It's amazing. The, the, the turnaround, something like this can do to the morale of a club. I I can't speak with the grandest authority uh, because I've never worn the uniform. But if I were to put myself in any of those players' shoes, of course you're always disappointed when you trade a brother, right? When you trade somebody who you really like and you're friends with and you feel like helps your team win. But I'd have to imagine, like, you feel significantly more at ease about it when you look around and you go oh, okay i get it like we're we're better now like we're, we're now better right like guys loved robbie ray they loved marco gonzalez right those were really popular guys in the clubhouse <coughs> um obviously paul seawald is beloved um but when you look at the team now i think you can say this is a better team than they rolled out on opening day last year. And I thought the team that rolled out on opening day last year was a better team than they rolled out the year before. So, okay. Like, I think it's a better team. Uh, and that's all they want. Like, all these guys want is to win. All they want to do is win the division and win the World Series. So, get me to that point is what I'm saying if I'm one of them. And I think that's how they generally feel. So we've picked up, for example, about wanting to see just better guys acquired in the clubhouse, even if you lose a friend. So like we've picked up like Justin Topa, Gabe Spire, Taylor Saucedo. Those three guys were really good friends. And I think both of them were pretty sad just from a personal standpoint to see Topa go, despite the impact that they got back for him in Polanco. But when we talked to Gabe Spire after the Santos trade, we prefaced it with all that and said, all that being said, you add an arm like that. Like, what's your reaction when you see that trade? And, and and Gabe says, obviously, like, you're fired up to have three dynamite arms like that at the back of your bullpen with Munoz, with Brash, with Santos. How could you not be fired up about it? So to the point of, like, these guys are watching what happens. They understand that there's a process behind all this. And then from a fan's perspective, like that Santos trade, for example, felt like icing on the cake. Like, after the Polanco trade, I said this was a mm-hmm. really good offseason. But then you go acquire a reliever like that with that much club control. Like, if you're a fan, you have to be fired up. And I think for players, it's the same thing. 100%. Like, Topa was beloved. I, I, I really enjoyed learning his story, telling his story, being around him. He's a young dad. His wife and his little baby were on the family trip. Like, he's just, he's just like the most normal guy ever because he's gone yeah. through so much adversity. He's just so grounded. Uh, but, 
Like, this is what happens. This is how it works, right? And if you can, the Mariners gave Topa a shot, and he gave them more than they could have ever hoped. And he had a far and away career year. Both sides won that, right? And now the Mariners got maybe what turns out to be the best year of Topa's career. Maybe not. We'll find out when it's all said and done. And you help use that to flip to Polanco. I mean, like, that's just that's just a great baseball move. Obviously, more was in the deal, but he was a big part of it. It's just a great baseball move. And, like, everyone should be happy about that, right? Everyone should be happy about that. I understand Sauce and Spire lose a buddy, but you know what? I, I, I have empathy for that, but they know. It's just the way this is. Everybody loses friends via trade. And sometimes, like Mitch, they come back. <laughs> Goldie, I want to get to you in the booth a little bit before we wrap up. And I want to preface this question in terms of the entire broadcast booth of the Mariners. What is a different trait, a different style, just sort of a different impact on the broadcast you would say each one of you bring to the broadcast day in and day out? Hmm, that's a good question. Boy, different, something different that each one of us brings. Um, let's see. Okay, well, uh, you know, Gary, I've never met anybody who's more prepared than Gary and has more just, I wish I would have found that type of nuggets. Like Gary's just, I think Gary really does a nice job balancing uh, the stories, uh, like unique stories about players and also like baseball. Gary is the smartest baseball person I've ever been around who didn't wear a jock. Like that's my best way to sum Gary up. Um, and we're just like super blessed to have him because he's a Tacoma guy, Mariners through and through, and does so much stuff for our broadcasts. I mean, from producing and engineering to actually calling play by play to hosting, um, to doing the Wheelhouse podcast with me, to producing the Mariners podcast, which there's like 850 episodes of. Um, he's just so curious and so smart. Like I, he's one of my absolute best friends. He's like a brother to me. And uh, I'm just, there's not enough success for Gary. How do I say this? Like Gary could have... The more success Gary has, the happier I will be. Like, he he deserves the world. He deserves the world. Couldn't think any higher of him. <coughs> um, like, Dave and Rick, I think, both bring a uh, kind of like an old-school baseball vibe to the broadcast, which is really fun and has a good spot uh, in, like, in any broadcast, TV or radio. And I think that is something that is really appreciated by a large percentage of our fan base and i completely understand why and what would you say you bring uh, <laughs> uh i mean i hope honestly if if somebody flips on and hears me talking and they say to themselves man aaron sounds like he's really having a fun time like that's that's what i hope now hey the season is long the games can be long those games can be good the games can be bad right um, I'm not so naive to think that I'm going to sound like I'm jumping in a bounce house for nine innings every night for six months. But I really, baseball brings me so much joy. Broadcasting brings me just so much happiness. And I genuinely feel a connection both to the club and to the fan base. And I want to just bridge that gap, right? as very best as I can and do it with a smile and do it with some laughs. And like, I'll, like I'll freely admit that there are things that excite me in a game that everybody else is just like, Aaron, that's super mundane and dumb and you shouldn't be giddy right now. Like anytime a pitcher catches a pop-up, like I lose my top. I just think it's the greatest thing in the world. Um, and I lose, I call it like a Julio game winning home run. Um, and like, I won't apologize for that. I think it's great. It never happens. And for the pitcher, like, I know how much pride they get when they can put a squeeze on a, on a pop fly. Uh, so stuff like that, uh, I hope, even if fans don't 
share my exact enjoyment. I hope they can at least get a kick out of me getting a kick out of it. We should probably throw immaculate inning into that category too, right? Oh, I mean, there's there's no greater achievement in sport than the immaculate inning, and I still have never seen one in person. I think I called a spring training one, um, but I I don't know exactly what I'll be like when that does happen. But you might have to scrape me off the floor. What was the? Can you give us a little bit of a peek behind the curtain? What it was like? I know it wasn't a real broadcast, but in your house this winter when you threw the immaculate inning with Matt Brash. Like oh, if there had been incredible. a camera on you, what yeah, would it have looked it like? It was, um, so my, my oldest son who was playing, he's nine. <clears throat> I think the only reason he knows what an immaculate inning is just because he watches so much Mariners. Um, but I wasn't going to bring it up because I was like, he has no idea what this is. And after I struck out the first two guys, he was like, dad, you're three pitches away from an immaculate inning. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, I love you. Eat all the ice cream you want. Um, <laughs> I was pretty stoked, man. Like, that's the closest I've ever been to an immaculate inning in any capacity. And he was, I did it against the Phillies, which is legit. Like, that's legit. So what's the pitch? Why, why are immaculate innings so important? Like, what's the, the context to you of why that should be so much more exciting than the general fan thinks of it? Yeah, no, it's a good, by the way, uh, the ninth strike was a slider, obviously, from Brash. Oh, of course. Of course. Um, okay. Let's start with the basic premise. Nine pitches, all strikes. If you put any big league pitcher up on the mound and just said, I need you to throw nine straight strikes, like, it's hard. Throwing nine strikes in a row is hard. So, like, that in and of itself, we take it for granted because we see guys throw strikes all the time. <clears throat> Nine in a row? That's a very difficult thing to do, especially when there's a hitter up there. So that to me is one. Number two, because I've had the debate with people of what's better, the immaculate inning or the three pitches, three outs, right? <clears throat> Which doesn't have a name. If anybody ever thinks of a name, I'd love to have one. I just call it the really good inning. Um, like you can get three outs on three pitches and it'd be a total rocket show. Like you could display no level of dominance because it could be three screamers at 110 miles an hour. Right. And they all found a fielder. Nine pitches, all strikes. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good night is like the, the ultimate form of dominance. I don't know if there's another, if there's a greater form of dominance in any sport than the strikeout. Like you could talk about, you could tell me like posterizing some dude, right? But like something that's actually a recorded statistic in a game. Like, I don't know. I'm open. But to me, the strikeout is maybe the greatest display of dominance over your competition. So to do it three in a row on the minimum number of pitches and just be like, get out of my way. I'm better than you. Like, and the fact that there's been so few of them just speaks to the point of how how difficult it is. That I how many have there been? <clears throat> well, there's only been one recorded one in Mariners history. Now, did Randy have one? I think he might have, but I won't keep track of them then. Felix has the only one. I mean, there's been there's been more no hitters than I believe there's been more no hitters than Immaculate Indians. But again, and I I, I will acknowledge the whole, you know. Pitch tracking era, right? 1988, I think, was the year. So, like, we are we are looking past a lot of immaculate innings that very well could have happened, and we just don't know. I'm sorry, there's nothing we can do about it. But I acknowledge that that is that's a, a little bit of a hiccup in the whole thing. Okay, Goldie, this is about to be your 12th year with the Mariners, and one of the things I really wanted to make, make sure we asked you during this conversation was – taking you all the way back to when you got the job, because I feel like there's a lot of people out there that probably don't know what an interview process looks like to get a big league broadcast job, and especially what it looks like when you have to travel out there and meet with all these different people. So I'd love to pick your brain about that a little bit, about what your interview process looked like to eventually get the Mariners job. Sure, absolutely. Um, I'll start by saying, just like a path to getting a big league job, the interview process, there's nothing standard about it. I have, whether it be my own experience 
or my own experience comparing to friends and colleagues who have been through similar, I mean, it can run the gamut. I had once had a friend tell me they interviewed for a job. This was a, a long time ago, well, well over probably like 15 years ago. And they gave him the Wonderlick test, <laughs> which like, let me tell you something, man. Ain't no way I'm getting a job if you give me a Wonderlick test. <laughs> I mean, I am straight back to Pawtucket by the time they get through grading half of it. They're like, Aaron, <laughs> just get on the plane. It's g- <laughs> goodbye. Goodbye. I mean, I would be terrified. I would flunk that thing in a heartbeat. Um, so the Mariners were super professional about it and very buttoned up, which – Keep in mind, like the position I interviewed for was on the totem pole of broadcasting. It was the it's the lowest rung. Like I was the number two radio guy. I'm gonna call three innings of play by play. It's not like I was interviewing for the lead radio voice or the lead TV voice. So for them to be as professional about it, given how low it was in terms of a, a resume or in terms of a profile, is a better way to put it, it speaks even more. Um, well, first of all, I I sent them a CD. It was in the still in the days of CDs, and uh, I got an email back a short while later that basically said, in so many words, "We have heard your demo tape, and we have put all of our applicants in one of two piles: a pile of those who we think stink, and a pile of those who we think don't stink." And congratulations, you're in the pile that we don't think stinks. You'll hear from us more shortly. And I was like, over the moon. Like, I couldn't believe it. I mean, it was the first big league job I'd ever applied for. I just got done calling my first season of AAA ball for the Red Sox organization in Rhode Island. Like, I had no business applying for this job. I was, I had stink pile written all over me. And to make it into the don't stink pile, I mean, I'd already won. Like, I'd won. This is incredible. Um, That's not actually what the email said, but that was the gist of it, obviously. So I then had a phone interview. And then after the phone interview, they flew me out. It was my first time ever to Seattle. I arrived on, like, one of the seven, that might be high, five just pristine, sunny winter days, right? Like, blue skies. 49 degrees, mountains are popping, lake is glistening, sound looks amazing. I was like, well, this place is it. Amazing. Um, I got an email from Randy Adamack, who was the gentleman who eventually hired me, who's recently retired but for the Mariners. Uh, just a sweetheart of a man who I'll, I'll always owe so much to. And he said, Tomorrow, we will be doing a mock roundtable in the radio booth with you, Rick Riz, and Mike Blowers. And the topic will be the outlook of the American League West in 2013. So be prepared to talk about that with those two guys, which was great that he gave me the heads up on it. Um, That morning, I had breakfast with two top executives for the Mariners, which was like the most terrifying way to begin. Like, can you give me some like media relations intern or some like, you know, social media hire, hire new hire that I could talk with first? Um, I'll never forget when we had breakfast. I was the first one to order and I really wanted the pancakes. I really wanted the pancakes, but I thought that would send a bad message, like just wolfing down some pancakes, <laughs> like with some like, like older, older gentlemen that I was dining with, like, mu- like more mature. Let's put it that way. And so I was like, man. Like nobody wants to eat oatmeal, but I think oatmeal would send a better message of just like, I'm like mature beyond my years, you know? So I was like, I'll take the uh, steel cut oats, please. (laughs) And uh, one of the gentlemen, one of the executives I was with said, you know what? That sounds good. I'll take the oatmeal as well. Yes. I was like so pumped. I was like, now we're talking. I've already (laughs) influenced a breakfast order. This is mine. Um, so I felt pretty good about that. I did not enjoy the oatmeal, but I felt like th- I thought this might pay me dividends, uh, further down the process. 
uh, eventually had moved on to a meeting with like all the heads of state. It was like pretty intimidating, honestly. I'm just this pipsqueak minor league broadcaster who like doesn't know anything, basically. And it was Randy. It was Kevin Martinez, who's now my boss, who was, uh, you know, senior VP. Rick. Kevin Kremen, who was the forever producer engineer for the Mariners on radio. He did. He was the producer and engineer for the Mariners on radio <coughs> for, if I'm remembering correctly, 35 of the first 40 years of the Mariners. So he's got a little bit of weight. He, he knows a thing or two. Our, at the time, our director on TV for the Mariners was there as well. And uh, there might have been one other person. Uh, but bottom line, it was like more people than I thought were going to be there, right? And they were all very nice, but they were just like just whizzing questions at me. I mean, just one after another about everything from your favorite player growing up to your style of broadcasting a game. Um, it was I remember it being fun, challenging but fun, and I'll just like kind of an out of body experience. I just couldn't believe that I was here doing this. I just, I didn't think that this would maybe ever come, let alone this early in my life. I then got lunch with Rick, uh, or I got lunch with Rick uh, later in the day, I guess. But then after that, we went to the home radio booth and we did the round table with Mike, my first time meeting Mike. And um, I remember walking into the home radio booth. I'd only been in one other big league radio booth before in my life. And it was not nearly as spacious as this one at T-Mobile Park. And we're like walking in and looking through the windows and looking at the grass and just kind of like panning my head from left to right, from foul pole to foul pole, and just looking at the ballpark. My first time ever seeing T-Mobile Park in person and just being like, man, this is just gorgeous. and. I was picturing myself calling games there. And then I started to like really feel myself kind of mentally spiraling. So I, I turned my back to the field. We put the headset on. We did the round table, which I overthought more than anything in my life. It's like, well, I don't want to say too much because then I'm hogging the conversation. But if I talk too little, the whole point is for me to talk. Like if I talk, if I don't talk enough, they're not going to know what I sound like. So trying to like balance this sweet spot with two people that I've never talked baseball with before and Mike and Rick. Um, and we got, Oh, and like half the people from the boardroom came up to the radio booth and sat in the, like the producers tier of the booth. So they're like right there, just looking down on you, <clears throat> which made me more nervous. <laughs> and um, I had no idea how it went when we were done. I was like, that could have been great. That might be the worst thing they've ever heard. I have no idea. I have no feel for how that went. Um, then we got. Then I got lunch with Rick, which was great. And um, I remember Randy gave me a full tour of the ballpark. Uh, Randy and I got dinner later that night. And uh, then it was like fly back to the East Coast and cross your fingers. And I really... I really convinced myself that I was not going to get it. I had heard of some other candidates and all of them had big league experience. I obviously did not. And I was like totally at peace with it. You know, you know this it's not my time yet. Um, I still got a lot to learn. And I was just over, over the moon and beyond belief that I got an interview at that early in my career with the big league team. I remember telling Heather, my wife, I remember saying, Hey, the next time I get one of these, like I'll be ready. I'll I'll be prepared. I'll 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 have a better idea as to what's coming at me. I'll be calmer, I'll be less nervous, and and maybe I'll get that one. And uh when they offered me the job, it was it was a moment I'll never forget. And it was outside of like the gender of our three children, which we were surprised with each kid, it was the biggest surprise of my life. Like honest honest to goodness. Couldn't believe it. So I have one last question for you, Goldie. I know Lyle has one more as well. I want to like take you back to then that first season. And I loved the way you described yourself because 
you, I, I feel like you were, you were honest with yourself and you've, you've, you've grown so much through now into your 12th season with the Mariners. But back then you called yourself quote, the least polished broadcaster in baseball. Do you like think back at that and laugh a little bit now? Oh, it's, yeah, it's a hundred percent. Right. Like I was, I just didn't know anything. I, I just, I was so bad. Um, and the, I don't know if this is a good thing or a bad thing. I kind of feel like it's a bad thing. Honestly, I knew it. Like there are people who stink and they don't know they stink. And so their confidence is still high, right? Like they feel good about themselves. I knew I wasn't great. And I knew I was kind of just faking it. Like I was in a real fake it till you make it situation. And because of that, I was super critical of myself really hard on myself i was so scared every night of messing a call up i would i really thought that there was a chance that i would finish this first year and the m's would say hey aaron you know we're, you're a nice enough guy but this just isn't working out and so because of that i just called every game not to lose right like I never got too excited on a big play. I never wanted to show any personality. I basically just called balls and strikes. So would give an anecdote, a story here or there. But it was pretty vanilla, man. Like everything. Everything was vanilla in a paper cup. And I just wasn't comfortable. I was scared. I was nervous. And it took more than two years. It took more than three years. Like it legitimately took in the neighborhood of five years for me. Now it could be totally different for somebody else, but it easily took five years to feel like, okay, you know what? Like I'm getting better. I'm learning. I'm smarter now. Like I can, I can be more me. Like the fans know me. I feel comfortable with them. Um, it was, it was not easy. I, and it, my level, it's funny. I, I enjoy my job more every year. And I'm so grateful for that. Like, I'm looking forward to this season more than any season I've ever done. And I enjoy prepping for spring training this year more than any season I've ever done. And I really hope that, like, my just upward ascent of enjoyment just it never peaks. I just hope it keeps going and I just ride the wave all the way to the very to the very end. Um, but it wasn't like that those first few years. It was just, just survive it, man. Just be grateful you got the gig, survive it, and try to figure out a way to get better. And so it was like a lot of desperation of just trying to like listen to myself. I could hear what was bad, force myself to do something different, and and get smarter at the same time. So I, I'm I'm fortunate. I'm I'm happy to say that I've I've fought through that part. Hopefully, I am still getting better. Um, I know there are still things that I hear that I want to work on that I know like I shouldn't, I shouldn't have said it that way. I should have said it this way or whatever. So that'll never leave. But I now feel like, okay, like I, I got something really good here and I've, I feel like I got a good vibe with at least enough of the fans. Like not, I always tell myself, not everybody likes ice cream. So like when, when somebody shreds me on Twitter, my wife always says to me, like, how, how can you read that and laugh? I say, well, not everybody likes ice cream, babe. Like, like there are people who just won't like me and there's nothing I can do about that. But that being said, to say that I don't want to be liked would be the biggest lie ever. Like this job is really hard to do if you're not liked. Like I, I want people to like my call. I want people to like my broadcast. I know it will not be everybody, but I hope it's at least 51%. Um, so I, I feel I feel comfortable with that now, and uh, that makes me sleep much better at night. Well, I think I can speak. Uh, the two of us can speak for pretty much the entire fan base to say Mariners fans are big Aaron Goldsmith fans and fans of your calls. So to wrap up, I thought this would be a good way to kind of wrap it all. Where you are, where you are in your profession, you're not really for what I assume, putting together broadcast tapes anymore. But for the sake of the exercise, I thought it'd be fun to give you a scenario where if you had to put together a broadcast tape right now and you had to start it with three Mariners calls of yours, what would it be? Okay. Can I be like, 
I'm sorry that you guys are the guinea pigs for this. I'm going to be like totally honest with the both of you. Mm-hmm. I have learned the hard way through like, honestly, just self-reflection. This is just my opinion. Okay. That like nothing can make a broadcaster sound like more of a snob than to say, let me tell you my favorite calls of myself. Okay. Like, I just, I, I don't like how I feel when I do that. Okay. Um, and unfortunately, you guys are the first ones to ask me since I've had this, this epiphany. <laughs> uh, so I will, I will avoid that because I don't like how I feel when I do it. Um, but I will say, um, I never have more fun than calling a big Julio play. Like a Julio play is as great as it gets, right? Because of how much it means to everybody. Like any player on the team can have a big moment. But when I think about Julio and his first two years and 2020 as a rookie, right? And then last year, 30 home runs, 30 bags, the whole thing. When I think about Julio calls, somewhere in the back of my mind, I always have in my thought, there's a chance this gets played on Mariner Vision 20 years from now when he goes into the Mariner's Hall of Fame, right? <clears throat> and so does that come into play when he hits a solo home run in the second inning in April for his second home run of the season? Like, no, like not, not so much. But when he has either big in-game moments, like say he had a four-homer game, right? Or when he breaks a substantial barrier, like the 2020 season, for example. Like when, when he was sitting on 19 home runs, I remember it was a – I say I remember, and now I'm like, wait a second. Let me think about that. <laughs> we were pl- the Mariners were playing the Nationals, and I think it was a scoreless tie late, seventh, eighth inning. And Julio comes up, and he's got 19 home runs. And in my mind, as he's walking to the plate, I'm thinking to myself, okay, if he hits a home run here, it means two things. It means the Mariners go up late in a back-of-the-season game that they really need, right? But it also means that he's the first Mariner since Mike Cameron for the 2020 season. How am I going to approach that? Because Julio's 2020 call will be archived. Like, it will be archived for this season. It will be archived for his career, right? So, in that moment, I remember thinking, I'm not going to worry at all about the game. If he homers here, I'm not going to say, the Mariners take the lead. It's one nothing Seattle. Everyone on TV, I was on TV. Everyone can see that. Everyone knows it, right? The story right now is Julio's the first Mariner since 2002 to have a 2020 season. Go with the story. <clears throat> and so that was predetermined, and he did it. He hit a home run. Like, I'm glad I thought it out. Uh, I milked the 2020, and I'm so glad that I didn't say somewhere in the call, the Mariners now lead the Nationals one to nothing, right? Like, if that call ever gets played again for some archival something, having one nothing Mariners over the Nationals in the call would, in my opinion, ruin the call. It just would. Like, nobody cares. Nobody cares. So I love the fact that his calls have such great significance from a franchise timeline standpoint and his historical standpoint. But I also love the challenge that it's given me. And it's really opened my eyes and my thinking in game as to how am I going to handle if he does something somewhat historic right now? How am I going to call it? as it pertains to him and the game. What am I going to lead with? And it happened again last year when he hit his 30th home run and became 
uh, and joined the 30-30 club. It gave it tied the game against the Angels in a super late inning, eighth inning, ninth inning, and again, I just went with Julio. Like I, I didn't go with the score because we all could see it. And right now, everybody in that ballpark is celebrating Julio. We like the fact that it helped the Mariners, but it's the Julio milestone that counted the most. So he's taught me to think on the fly in a way like that that I had never done before. So he, he's made me a better broadcaster, I think. To wrap will, it up, oh, go ahead, Lyle. Oh, I was just going to say that that's all a really good answer, and it makes sense. You don't want to pick three calls. I was going to say if I had to pick for you, I probably would have picked the Dom Canzone homer against the Orioles last year, and then a couple of those plays from the extra inning game in 22 against the Yankees with, like, the what a silly hack and then the behind-the-back stab by Brash. Like, those are a couple of mine if you want them. Oh, it's, okay, the what a silly hack is, the, is one of the only things I've ever said on the air that I immediately was like, oh, my gosh. Is somebody going to be mad at me about that? Like, is another player, <laughs> like, is Glaber Torres? I actually remember thinking during the commercial break, I'm glad it's the final game of the series and I'm not going to see Glaber Torres again this year. Like, the Mariners had already played the Yankees once in New York. So, I, because I, somebody was going to say to him, yeah, that Mariners guy said, what a silly hack. <clears throat> um, he probably wouldn't have cared at all. But I remember, I do remember thinking that. The um, Canzone home run was one of the most surprising home runs. I'd ever seen like that's the last guy you thought would park one off the windows. He hit it so high. I couldn't judge the trajectory of it at first. So like in my call, like off the bat, I'm kind of like, Oh, that's a right field. Right. And then I, whoever was in right field for the Orioles, I remember them not only turning around, but like their head cocked back like a Pez dispenser so high. Like they couldn't, they couldn't have looked any higher in the air. And that was my cue to just let it rip. You know, I'm like, okay, this thing is to the moon. I'm just going to let it fly. And I'm going to trust this, this Orioles outfielder. He might hose me, but if he's right, this thing's going to be good. Um, the, the, back to the New York game, I've never enjoyed a game more in my life. That's the greatest game I've ever been a part of. I, it was honestly... I might have enjoyed it more than the playoff games that I got to call a couple of years ago, which is like ridiculous to say because it's the playoffs. But that game was just incredible. And it was like a pitching display on both sides like I had never seen. Just ultra velo show, right? I remember going on Savant, going to the game feed. You know how like on Savant you can go to um, like all pitches and it's just like a running catalog of every pitch. And it was somewhere like in the sixth or the seventh inning, and I clicked on sort by velocity descending. And I just started scroll like scrolling on my iPad, like 99, 99, 99, 99, 98, 98, 98, 98, 98 right? To 97, 96. And there was not a fastball thrown under 95 miles an hour at that point in the game. And it was late. It was late in the game. Um, and it was for the Yankees, and it was a packed house, and it was Cole and Castillo, and just like the juice in the yard. Um, I, just, I, if I could create a machine to go back and relive a game, that's the game I would pick. I do want to get a ranking out of you to wrap it up though, Goldie. So instead of calls as a noted Taco Bell enthusiast, oh, yeah. it's your top three Taco Bell menu items. I'm in a pretty hard rut for the, um, cheesy gordita crunch with steak. Like spend the extra 73 cents. It's different in your precinct, but just spend whatever just I, it's better than the ground beef okay like i don't know what animal that's coming from <laughs> get the steak uh i say that about the ground beef but i do consume it in the mexican pizza you know mexican pizza went bye-bye for a while and then they brought it back and uh i, I do have a lot of nostalgia as a kid crushing some t-bell mexican pizzas um if i'm like trying to not completely pig out and i'm trying to have like a little bit of a lighter meal i'll get the um the chicken cheese chalupa i do enjoy the texture of the chalupa shell um i've my son which it makes me very proud like he loves t-bell like we will we will go on late night t-bell runs with some occasion but i just i've tried to cut back boys I've tried to it's hard it's hard i know what about you guys? 
Cheesy Ordita Crunch is far and away a number one. I'm like, I'm pissed at the Quesarito. Like, it's been gone forever. And that was, that thing was the best. I have had a Quesarito. They're really good. Uh, I couldn't indulge to that level anymore, but I respect that. I respect that greatly. It was just like a, a Friday tradition in high school. Every, oh, yeah. every Friday. That's good. That's a good one. So, uh, man. It's disappointing. At this point, it's gone. It hasn't even been considered to come back. They they bring some things it, back, but it seems very labor intensive to make. Maybe it slowed down the production line. Perhaps, yeah, yeah that would make sense. But the cheesy gordita crunch does carry a ton of weight. And you like you might not be as big of a fan of the ground beef, but that combination, soft and hard shell, yeah, oh yeah, is unmatched. No, it's great. It's a textural unmatched. taste sensation. You can't you can't. Yeah, no. I agree. Well, Goldie, this has been. Awesome. We appreciate you taking some time to join us here. Really looking forward to hearing you on the radio and on Root Sports this season. It's going to be a bunch of fun, and it's going to be even more fun with you on the call. So I appreciate you taking some time to join us here today. Absolutely, guys. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Incredible conversation with Goldie. He's he's the best. Uh, like literally, I, I don't know how else to describe that. He is the best. Before we wrap up the show... Let's hear a word from BetterHelp. Is something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals? Regardless, if you have a clinical mental health issue like depression or anxiety, or you're just a human who lives in this world who's going through a hard time, therapy can give you the tools to approach your life in a very different way. And that's why I'm excited to tell you about today's sponsor, BetterHelp. BetterHelp's mission is to make therapy more affordable and more accessible. And this is an important mission because finding a therapist can be really hard, especially when you're limited to options in your area. BetterHelp is a platform that makes finding a therapist easier because it's online, it's remote, and by filling out a few questions, BetterHelp can match you to a professional therapist in as little as a few days. It's easy to sign up and get matched with a therapist. There's a link in our description. It's betterhelp.com slash marine layer pod. That's better com slash marine layer pod. Clicking that link helps support this podcast, but also gets you 10% off your first month of BetterHelp so you can connect to the therapist and see if it helps you. So if you're struggling, consider online therapy with BetterHelp. Click the link in the description or visit betterhelp.com slash marine layer pod. That was a fun show. All right. That'll just wrap it. That'll just about wrap it up for this edition of the Marine Layer Podcast. You guys know the drill. If you want to listen to the full form podcast, you can do so wherever you get your audio pods. Make sure to download, rate, and review. Leave five stars. Leave a written review. It all helps a bunch. Like, comment, subscribe over on YouTube if you're watching, and you can follow us on social media. We're on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, and YouTube Shorts at Marine Layer Pod. That's TJ. I'm Lyle. As always, we thank you guys for tuning in. We'll talk to you soon.